Wouldn't it be easier just to say that God used evolution to create? Wouldn't that make it easier to witness to non-believers? Stay tuned for the answers. There's currently a huge push with some groups trying to get Christians to embrace evolution, to marry Genesis and the millions of years of the evolutionary story. And uh, it's, it's just remarkable that uh, what some of these people believe. And on this program this week, we want to actually from their own mouths, we're going to show you what these people actually believe about, uh, about the gospel and about how mixing evolution with Genesis, what it does to, to their faith and what they want to push on the rest of Christianity. Right. So leading the pack here is Francis Collins, well-known scientist, Christian. He leads Biologos, and uh, the Biologos Foundation, uh, they say they explore, promote, and celebrate the integration of science and Christian faith. There's another group out there called Evolutionary Christianity, which is a group of evolution. Uh, Christian evolutionists, and uh, they, they held a, a, a teleseminar series um, talking about their group. Now, their group says that uh, they, an evolutionary worldview can enrich your life, deepen your faith, and bless our world according to the front page of their website. Oh, it all sounds good. It all sounds good. And we want to blend, blend the Bible with science as well. That's what CMI does. Exactly. We're showing how science and the Bible fit yeah. together as well. But they say whatever your background or beliefs, whether you consider yourself conservative, moderate, liberal, radical, or something else uh, altogether, we invite you to join in this historic exploration of how a sacred, deep-time view of grace and guidance can expand your faith and inspire and empower you in ways that believers in the past could only dream of. That sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? That you've got okay. a sacred understanding of deep time, millions of years, and grace, and 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 you know people in the past, Christians in the past, Believers because they the, didn't, you know, like, like the Apostle Paul, bless his heart, you know, he he tried to uh, believe in a real Adam and and link Jesus back to that, and I guess I guess we're jumping ahead a little bit, yeah, but he yeah. he really didn't understand science the way we do, so he really didn't fully understand the the, the doctrines of grace and, and atonement and so on. Exactly, it Interesting. starts to starts to fall apart here. One of the Biologus articles says, on what grounds can uh, one claim that the Christian God is the creator? From their own article, it says the creation story of Biologus, which is God used evolution, is compatible with many faith traditions. Muslims, Jews, and Christians alike can align their faith with the Biologus account of origins. So here we, we start understanding that, well, wait a sec, this isn't, you know, promoting Christianity because it can promote any faith system, this, this belief I mean, they've adopted. It's back to ecumenicalism and, and uh, um, what, what do we have in common with Muslims? Right. Uh, <laughs> not a lot. Uh, on the Evolutionary Christianity website, one of the, the quotes, studying evolution is like following cosmic breadcrumbs home to God. Only by looking through evolutionary eyes can we see our way out of the current global integrity crisis that is destroying economies and ecosystems around the world. Well, wait a minute here. This, this sounds like some environmental pitch or something like that. What right. does this have to do with Christianity? Yeah. That's a little bit of an odd, uh, odd take. But yeah, and yet these are quotes right from the, the major players in this movement to combine the two, exactly. uh, uh, Genesis and evolution. Let's look at uh, one of the uh, uh, most famous um, theistic evolutionists. Here's Michael Dowd. Yes. And uh, he's, he's written the book. He's a former evangelical pastor. He's written this book called Thank God for Evolution. He goes across... America worldwide and speaking about uh, evolution and his website uh, seems really friendly you know towards uh, towards the Christian faith of course he calls himself a Christian he says evolutionary Christianity involves enthusiastically embracing a deep time worldview which will embrace biblical and traditional ex expressions conservative and liberal and God glorifying Christ edifying scripture honoring again it sounds like you know your typical Christian ministry etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's inter interesting to see what he actually teaches. Under his general heading of how to realize personal salvation, he writes this, time and again I've watched young people experience salvation by learning about their evolutionary heritage, that they are the way they are because those drives served their ancient ancestors. Hallelujah, he says. Well, wait a sec, that's salvation? You, you learn that really you're not a sinner because you're, these evolutionary drives that you, you had, you, that you inherited, you understand yeah, you, to embrace you, you, that? You just accept them. Now, now they're attacking sin 
and, and what sin is. Exactly. It's no longer disobeying God and, and disobeying what the Bible says for how, for how we ought to live. It's, well, it, it's just your evolutionary past that causes you to do these things. It's not really bad. Let's finish off with this quote here. Of necessity, this evolutionary effort will also mean that some of the teachings of Christianity will be translated almost beyond recognition, just as our skin is so unlike that of our scaly reptilian ancestors, then too some passages will have so little utility that they will disappear just as our primate tail was lost within our lineage of apes. In 2004, New Scientist magazine published an open letter to the scientific community in which 33 leading scientists blasted the Big Bang. Their strongly worded letter included statements like, The Big Bang today relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities, things that we have never observed. Without them, there would be a fatal contradiction between the observations made by astronomers and the predictions of the Big Bang theory. But the Big Bang theory can't survive without these fudge factors. An open exchange of ideas is lacking in most mainstream conferences and doubt and dissent are not tolerated. With such growing dissension from secular scientists, it's unfortunate that many Christian leaders have embraced the Big Bang, especially when there are so many contradictions between it and the Bible's account of creation in Genesis. And Genesis is the word of the Creator who witnessed creation, unlike any scientist. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Now, we've just gone through some amazing admissions from some of these folks, these theistic evolutionists that attempt to combine the two, and it's just amazing. What does evolution actually mean? Here's a statement summarizing what evolution actually means from the National Association of Biology Teachers. They said this, The diversity of life on Earth is the outcome of evolution, an unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable, and natural process of temporal descent with genetic modification that is affected by natural selection, chance, historical contingencies, and changing environments. Well, wait a sec. Unsupervised means no creator God. Right. Impersonal means life has no special meaning. It's impersonal. Yes. Unpredictable means we're a product of blind chance. And natural processes mean processes that are inherent in matter. And people want to blend this with the Bible. Exactly. On the Biologus website, there's a, a fellow named uh, Dr. Peter Enns, and he, he writ, wrote an essay. Yes. Now, prepare to be shocked uh, by, by what um, Peter um, actually said here. Now, first, he, uh, I'll just set up what he's talking about. <coughs> he says, evolution demands that the special creation of the first Adam, as described in the Bible, is not literal history. No real Adam if evolution is true. No, no. Paul, however, seems to require it. Now, what purpose does the obedience of the second Adam have, if not to counter the actual disobedience of the first Adam? Uh, if there was no first Adam, from whom every human is descended, then there's no fall. If there's no fall, there's no true inescapable sinful condition where we are dead in sin. Uh, like Ephesians and Colossians says, and if we're not dead in sin, there's no need of a savior. Right. You get rid of the first Adam, you don't need a last Adam. Now, he's admitting this. He's saying, well, but, right? He, so he's, yeah. he, he's trying to write this article saying, okay, well, these are real problems that Christians are, you know, are, are struggling with here. So let, let's think of some options how we can, we can make this work. Okay, so he's so, got four options here in, four in options. his, uh, in his <clears throat> article. Right. He said number one option would be to accept evolution as valid and embodying tremendous explanatory power and reject Christianity in the whole. So you just do what the atheists do. You say, well, yeah, the Bible doesn't work anymore because okay. obviously evolution... And many people have gone that route. Yes. Two, develop a true scientific model open to peer review that supplies Christian theology with a first pair of some sort and so reconcile Christianity and evolution. You say, well... You know, but there was a first pair, but we don't really know, but evolution yeah. seems... You know. A true scientific model there, of course, he's talking about evolutionary exactly. model. Number three here, rethink the Bible, uh, biblical origin story and related passages so as to synthesize Christianity with scientific reality. Again, he's talking about evolution, evolution right? Yeah. So we're going to rethink the story. It doesn't really mean what it says. The Bible doesn't really mean what it says, etc. And then he says, accept Paul's understanding of human or origins as scientifically accurate and reject evolution. That's what we've done, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, yeah. We've rejected but, evolution. Uh, we we say wouldn't state it that way, that Paul's <laughs> view is, is, is scientifically accurate. We would say it's historically accurate. Uh, that's right. Now, what's interesting is, is he goes on to say, here's, here's his analysis of his own explanations. He says, the second option is somewhat problematic. The fourth option is untenable as members of the human race in the 21st century, so ignoring... That's the, that's the closest to what CMI would teach. Right, he's saying that you, you can't not believe in evolution. The first option, rejecting Christianity, is more viable than the fourth. 
and does not suffer from an ad hoc posture of the second, but is certainly not the necessary one. And then he, he wants to take number three. He thinks rethinking the biblical story, that's the best way to do it. But if you catch what he actually says, he says the first option, rejecting Christianity, is more viable than the fourth. Rejecting the Christian faith is more viable than actually believing what the Bible says and what Paul taught about origins. And this guy writes articles in, in Christian journals and, uh, and speaks in, in seminaries and Bible colleges. Yes. And I mean, I, I don't know if any of you watching the program are a little shocked at this. Um, certainly the first time I, I, I saw this stuff, I thought, what is going on? That's right. So he, he, he's actually teaching a position that says, you know, it, intellectually, it makes a lot more sense to just abandon your faith than to actually believe what the Bible says because science has disproven uh, the Genesis account of, of origins. We know evolution is a fact now. If you don't accept that, et cetera, et cetera, it would be better for you to just uh, abandon your Christianity than to, than it's to a, go it's with It's amazing. That. All of this stems from, the, from, stems from what they believe is, is a fact of the great antiquity of the earth. The earth is obviously old, therefore we have to go with evolution that it just doesn't make any sense going with the, the biblical story of creation in the way it's written. It all has to do with the age of, of the universe, which they have got wrong. Richard Van Grad and Calvin Smith also host a fast-paced and informal internet-based video program called Genesis Unleashed. These faith-building teaching videos feature responses to news articles, summaries of articles on creation.com, interviews, and answers to some of the most asked questions about the creation evolution issue and the most attacked book of the Bible, Genesis. Visit creation.com's media center to view or subscribe to the latest video content. All right, well, here we go, and this is going to get even more strange. We're going to look at the spiritual journey of Carl Giberson. Right. And uh, he is, again, a theistic evolutionist, one of these folks who is convinced that the universe is billions of years old and evolution is an absolute fact and must be married somehow with the scripture. Yeah, he actually wrote a book, Saving Darwin, How to Be a Christian and Believe in Evolution. Right. And uh, we've got a, a book review on our website that you can take a look at. So these are from his, this is from his own mouth. We're these just going to quote him, right? That's right. We're yes. just going to do a lot of quotes here because he calls Genesis an old-fashioned fairy tale as a Christian. He says because it's got things like talking snakes and magical gardens. He that, calls himself a Christian, though. But yeah. That's right. So Genesis is a fairy tale. Uh, what happened? Well, he went to, to Bible college, and his uh, Bible professor, this is his own words, assaulted my literalist reading of Genesis, suggesting that Genesis should, Genesis should be read as poetry. Uh, he says all the, the science faculty, which all claim to be Christians, were all evolutionists as well. He said, I turned with some optimism to religion scholars, but found they had little to offer. Some of them strangely insisted on the historicity of some portions of the Genesis story. The fall, for example, was sometimes an important part of an elaborate theological system serving the critical function of getting God off the hook uh, for a creation filled with so much suffering. Now, uh, he's referring here to Daniel Dennett, who was an atheist, and he called uh, Darwinism a uh, universal acid that eroded all traditional values, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and Giberson is quoting Dennett's uh, acid metaphor. He said, acid is an appropriate metaphor for the erosion of my fundamentalism as I slowly lost my confidence in the Genesis story of creation. Dennett's universal acid dissolved Adam and Eve. It ate through the Garden of Eden. It destroyed the historicity of the events of the creation week. It etched holes in the, those parts of, the, of Christianity connected to these stories, the fall, Christ as the second Adam, the origin of sin, and nearly everything else I counted sacred. Wow, so we can amazing. see here, it's not just affecting Genesis, but all of Scripture. These uh, are his words, folks. He says, I understand how honest thinkers and seekers after the truth, like Daniel Dennett and Michael Roos, atheists, can end up rejecting God. Like uh, uh, that of most thinking Christians, my belief in God is tinged with doubts, and in many more reflective moments, I sometimes wonder if I am perhaps simply continuing along the trajectory of a childhood faith that should be abandoned. As a purely practical matter, I have compelling reasons to believe in God. My parents are deeply committed Christians and, I, and would be devastated were I to reject my faith. My wife and children believe in God and we attend church together regularly. Most of my friends are believers. I have a job I love at a Christian college that would be forced to dismiss me if I were to reject the faith that underpins the mission of the college. Abandoning belief in God would be disruptive, sending my life completely off the rails. I can sympathize with Darwin as he struggled against the unwanted challenges to his faith. 
So his, his reason for continuing on in Christianity isn't about the truth of the death and resurrection of Christ. It's not about what God has done in his life right. or the Holy Spirit working in, in his sanctification. No. It's, it's nothing about that. It's, well, my, my family would be upset and, and, and well, we, you know, it, it's all of these, these other things. He's not a Christian. Exactly. By his own admission in these quotes that we've just read, <laughs> right. he's not a Christian. I mean, look what he says here. By his third year in college, this is from our book review, he said this, he was now wearing scientific spectacles almost all of the time, and as a result, non-evolutionary explanations for life looked a little too convenient to me. He said, he writes, he had come to the point where, by definition, nothing could ever be explained by reference to God. Well, folks, let's look at Romans 1.20. It says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Here the Bible says that no one will have an excuse on Judgment Day because you can know there is a God because of what he created. There's and so much evidence for creation and so much evidence that God created recently. It, it boggles my mind. I know when we you know, put the content together for this yeah. program this week, uh, it boggles my mind that such smart men could say things that are so dumb. <laughs> and I mean, it, it, it's not, we're not trying to throw insults here. These are smart guys. Right. These are scholars. These but, guys are, are professors. But these, it's, many young Christians are looking at these people and go, wow, they're really bright and they're, they're really good. Folks, if you know someone at church that said, well, I only go to church because my mom and dad are Christians and my wife's a Christian and, right. and, and I've yeah. got a good job and they, they'd have to fire me. Would you consider them a believer? Of course not. And, and would you want to follow the system of thought that they actually teach? We'll get into some more next uh, segment. In the early 90s, researchers from Montana State University made a startling discovery. Inspecting a piece of T-Rex bone under a microscope, they could hardly believe their eyes. They could see dinosaur red blood cells. This discovery prompted lead scientist Dr. Mary Schweitzer to say, it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. But of course I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones after all are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? In a Discover magazine article, Dr. Schweitzer explained further her surprise. If you take a blood sample and stick it on a shelf, you have nothing recognisable in about a week. So why would there be anything left in dinosaurs? Such a response is understandable, considering that she thinks dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. But surely such data suggests it wasn't that long ago. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. We've heard many times uh, skeptics, people who believe in evolution, Christians, uh, say that, well, you're putting a stumbling block in people's path if you say they have to believe in God creating recently in six literal days, just like Genesis says, the stumbling block to, to accepting Christ. Yeah. Just add evolution into the Bible. But does that really help the situation when right. it comes to evangelism, just blend evolution with Genesis? Yeah, this, this concept that we're going to be anti-intellectual if we don't accept evolution in millions of years because science has proven that and therefore you're going to appear weak you know, mentally, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's a stumbling block. I mean, people, Christians have said, come on, Cal, you, like Giberson, you can't believe in Genesis. Either. Come on, it talks about a talking snake. Yeah, but in Deuteronomy, it talks about a talking donkey. So what part of the Bible are you going to be embarrassed about here? Are you going to, you're going to throw that to the side too? How about, you know, well, we only accept things that are experimentally science is, is verified. How about the floating axe head? Anybody done that experiment lately? No, yeah, I haven't seen one it of those. It sinks. Yep. People don't live in, in whales for three days unless God says that they're, they're, they're going to. And, and how about people walking yeah. into a fiery furnace? I mean, come on. There are miracles throughout the Bible. If, if you're going to say, well, we can't accept anything that isn't scientific, you've got to throw out the whole thing. Right. It's not just Genesis. That's a problem. So is this helping with witnessing? What, what do the atheists think? Um, this is uh, uh, an atheist uh, uh, who's reviewing two books. Uh, this is Jerry Coyne uh, down in the States. He's reviewing two books by theistic evolutionists, uh, Giberson and, and Miller, uh, two theistic evolutionists. And look what he says. Like Giberson, Miller rejects a literal interpretation of the Bible. After discussing the fossil record, he contends that a literal reading of the Genesis story is simply not scientifically valid contending that theology does not and cannot pretend to be scientific, but it can require of itself that it be consistent with science and conversant with it. But this leads to a conundrum. Why reject the story of creation in Noah's Ark? Because we know that animals evolved, but nevertheless accept the reality of the virgin birth and resurrection of Christ, which are equally at odds with science. 
After all, biological research suggests the impossibility of human females reproducing asexually or of anyone reawakening three days after death. Clearly, Miller and Giberson, along with many Americans, have some theological views that are not consistent with science. Yeah, How yeah do you it's getting over at that, that point. It, logically, this, this is perfect logic. Yeah. Right? The atheist sees through the, 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 the problems, in the, the, the break in logic there. That, that atheist is, is no closer to uh, becoming a Christian than, than uh, had, they, had they just gone with God created in six days, That's what right. the scripture says. He said, without good cause, Giber, Giberson and Miller pick and choose what they believe. At least the young earth creationists are consistent, for they embrace supernatural causation across the board. You know, that's right. I'd take that as a backhanded compliment <laughs> from an atheist, to be honest, because at least we're not getting caught with our pants down theologically. Yes. If you want to yes. argue the scientific evidence, bring it on all day long. But I'm not going to get caught compromising on what God's word uh, says. Um, how about uh, Biologus, the website? You know, you can post comments and stuff like that. What are atheists saying about them trying to accept evolution? Right. Um, I thought this was a pretty f candid comment. Uh, yeah, somehow not buying it. And I would have noted the blatant contradiction even in my Bible-believing days as well. Uh, do you ever get tired of trying to tying yourself into a pretzel, trying to ignore obvious logical implications and to keep others from noting them? Again, this is just, it's just Even, common sense. It doesn't work. <laughs> yes, it doesn't it, work. It just doesn't fit. Here's another atheist uh, commenting on the, the, the uh, Blag Hag, another blog. Are people truly supporters of evolution if they're not accepting it as a natural process? Do people really understand natural selection if they think God is zapping in mutations or had a plan for humans to eventually evolve? How can you blend an unsupervised, random, creative process with God as the creator? He's just like, do you, yes. you know. Do you and just, these, these writers into these websites here, um, kind of uh, weekend atheists, probably most of them, can <laughs> see the contradictions in trying to have Clearly. theism and evolution altogether, Christian theism. Yeah. Al Mohler, uh, a well known theologian yes. in, down in the United no. States, he's a, done an open letter to Carl Giberson uh, talking about him trying to synthesize this. This is what he said. If you're. Carl Giberson's intention in his book, Saving Darwin, is to show how to be a Christian and believe in evolution. Uh, what you've actually succeeded in doing is to show how much doctrine Christianity has to surrender in order to accommodate itself to evolution. In doing this, you and your colleagues at Biologos are actually doing us all a great service. You're showing us what the acceptance of evolution actually costs in terms of theological concession. Amazing. With all the responsibilities that most pastors have, it is often too much to ask them to keep up with all the latest science that supports the Bible and creation. The Information Department at CMI reviews the leading evolutionary science publications so that our scientists and speakers are both constantly updated with the latest evolutionist information and able to refute it. Give your pastor a break. Book a CMI speaker into your church for a faith-strengthening Sunday morning message. Visit creation.com to contact your nearest CMI office. For this week's In the News, we've chosen an article by Carl Giberson. Right. And uh, in, in this article here, uh, again in the Huffington Post, where he writes, he says, Surve survey results recently reported by Christianity, Christianity Today clarify once again the sober truth that evangelicals are not making much progress in accepting well-established main mainstream scientific ideas about origins. I count that as a good thing. Right. <laughs> Particularly disturbing is the find that only 27% of evangelical pastors strongly disagree with statements that the earth is 6,000 years old. A higher number strongly agree that the earth is just 6,000 years old, a conclusion refuted by mountains of evidence, Giberson writes. Seven in ten evangelical pastors strongly disagree that God used evolution to create people. Of course, Giberson sees this as a massive negative um, because he says, well, you know, this is, uh, he says further, further down, uh, one of the reasons young people uh, or, or young adults feel disconnected from the church or from faith is the tension they feel between Christianity and science. Absolutely, there's a tension between Christianity and science. Exactly. What, and the common uh, teachings that are, are being taught. And of course, evolution, science is yes. being equivocated with evolution here. That's what he's calling science. He's calling evolution science. Right. Right. We uh, exist, CMI exists, in order to show people that science supports the Bible without modifying the Genesis text. Right. Giberson has a different idea. But his article is titled, Creationists Drive Young People Out of the Church. He's accusing yes. people that take the Bible as plainly written, were the cause 
of making people turn away from the church. Well, let's go to the most fa famous atheist on the planet today, uh, Dr. Richard Dawkins. He, he's yeah. a prolific writer, all sorts of books. We've talked about him many times, folks. You, everybody should probably know who Dawkins is. Let's go and ask Dawkins why he turned away from the Christian faith. And was there a particular point that, or something that you read or an experience you had that sort of said, yeah, this is it, God doesn't exist? Oh, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. Um, I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way in seeing uh, evolution as the enemy, um, whereas the more, what should we say, sophisticated theologians who are quite happy to live with evolution I think they're deluded, and I think the, I think the evangelicals have got it right uh, in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity, and I think I realized that at the age of about 16. Now that clip was from our, our friends at Revelation TV. Right. Thank you, Mr. Conger, okay? for uh, supplying that. Um, here you can see that evolution was the reason that Dawkins became an atheist, and many atheists have similar stories. Right. Yeah, even, even many of them were toying with the Christian faith, or their parents were Christians, and then they leave Christianity because of evolution. Now, Giberson would say, yeah, but if, if we just accept evolution, that's why. But look what Dawkins says. He says yes. it's, the, it's the liberal theologians. He, he says, no, no, <laughs> the evangelicals have it right when they're fighting against evolution because it doesn't fit with the Bible, but these more, well, you know, he, they're deluded. He, he's calling Giberson deluded, deluded yes. the biggest atheist on the planet. Here's another thing to consider. Giberson here is saying, listen, we need to accept evolution because that's the way we're going to save the church. But do you remember some of the quotes that we quoted from uh, Dr. Giberson here? I understand how honest thinkers and seekers after the truth like Daniel Dennett and Michael Roos, atheists, can end up rejecting God like that of the most uh, thinking Christians, my belief in God is tinged with doubts and in my more reflective moments, I sometimes wonder if I'm perhaps simply continuing along the trajectory of a childhood faith that should be abandoned. I mean, do you remember what he said, why he went to church? Well, because his parents go. And yes, his mom. yes. So is he really saying that what we should do is we should all become like he is? Oops. We, we, we should all accept <laughs> evolution, reject large portions of Scripture, Yes. Even this yeah. part that, 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 that Jesus quoted as, as, as being the Word of God, and we should be more like Him because that's going to make us have strong yeah. Christians that's, in the that's church. That's just nonsense. What we found in reality is that exactly the opposite is true. <laughs> Many of our staff, uh, the scientists and otherwise, they came from a background of atheism and evolution, and it was, uh, it was understanding the history in Genesis and, and understanding the science that supports that, that our website has, has in, in, in abundance. Right that led them to an understanding of the authority of the Bible and finally led them to Christ. That's what gets people saved, not a blending of atheistic thought with the Bible.